a hatred toward his absent parents, a disgust for women, and the thirst for notoriety. These were just three of many motives that drove the crossbow cannibal. Motives that would in the end, take three innocent lives. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to Coffee House Crime. In today's video we're heading to England to look at the case of Stephen Griffiths, also known as the crossbow cannibal. By the way, I post both solved and unsolved cases here on a weekly basis, so if true crime is your kind of thing, then please consider subscribing to Coffee House Crime, and I may just have to buy you a coffee. So, who is Stephen Griffiths? What did he do to give himself such a gruesome title? And who were the victims to this dark, edgy serial killer? Allow me to tell you the story. In the meantime, pull up a seat, grab a coffee, and sit back. This is the case of Stephen Griffiths. In today's case, we're heading a little bit closer to home, to the industrial city of Bradford, located in West Yorkshire, England. Previously known as the Wall City, Bradford was an affluent area during the Industrial Age, with thanks to unparalleled prominence in textile manufacturing, and geographical access to coal, fuel, and iron. This led to the city of Bradford thriving, with a rapidly accelerating economy, population growth, and an abundance of fine Victorian architecture. However, at the start of the 20th century, in the midst of the UK's deindustrialization downfall, Bradford's economy and therefore its status began to decline. Whilst facing both the economic and social challenges that many of North England's post-industrial cities suffered, Bradford took a particularly nasty hit, with vast unemployment and poverty becoming the norm in what was once a vibrant and bustling city. Nowadays, Bradford is very much a global city, with a population of over 500,000 residents commonly speaking over 50 languages, the city is rich with diversity and culture, and arguably has some of the finest curry restaurants that the UK has to offer. But when it comes to wealth, the city itself is very strongly divided, being home to some of the richest and some of the poorest people in the country. With some of the highest crime rates in the UK and one of the busiest red light districts in the country, Bradford is not at the top of anyone's list to settle or visit. Located only 10 miles southeast of Bradford lies a small town called Dewsbury. Dewsbury, which, much like its larger neighbour, was once prominent in the long diminished wool industry. The year is 1969. And on the 24th of December, while everyone else was busy getting ready for Christmas, Stephen Griffiths was introduced to planet Earth. His parents were Moira Dewhurst, a telephone saleswoman, and Stephen Griffiths Sr., a fishmonger and food salesman. The two were a modestly middle-class couple, certainly not wealthy, but they were getting by just fine in Stephen's younger years. However, as time went on and two more babies followed, money became more and more of an issue. And the couple's marriage was anything but perfect. Arguments and discord happened very frequently in the household. Unfortunately, this meant that they divorced just several years later. Following the divorce and custody hearings, Stephen and his siblings moved away with his mother. The four were eventually relocated to a council house, a type of social housing that is rented out at less than market rates to those in financial need. This would eventually lead to further problems in the family household. Moira, who was struggling to make ends meet, would often cut corners and falsely claim government benefits, something that, in 1981, would lead to a conviction in benefit fraud. The divorce of his parents, the upheaval of his life, and now the conviction of his mother created a very turbulent environment for Stephen. And although his father was able to pay his way into a private school, Stephen became a delinquent teenager, regularly drinking as well as shoplifting. In fact, at the age of only 17, Stephen slashed a store manager after they tried to stop him shoplifting, an offence that landed him in youth custody for three years. And his thoughts became pretty dark during that time. He developed a fascination with serial killers, and even told officers that he fantasised about becoming one. His time in youth custody soon began to add up as days turned into weeks, weeks into months, and months into years. And by 1989, Stephen Griffiths finally walked out as a free man, having completed his sentence. 
It was at this stage that, no pun intended, he severed all ties with his family. This may or may not have further contributed to Stephen's delinquency, as, very soon after completing youth custody, he was again before a magistrate, this time for illegal possession of an air pistol. An air pistol that he would routinely use to shoot birds, before taking them home to dissect and study in his own privacy. And if that wasn't enough, Stephen would once again find himself in court in 1991, when he was sentenced to two years in prison after holding a knife to a young woman's throat. At this point in our case, it's becoming pretty obvious that Stephen is a severe danger to society. I'm not just talking about red flags here, I'm talking about recurrent acts of violence coupled in with troubling tendencies. Now interestingly, Stephen was an intelligent man. Although he would remain unemployed and financially survive off of benefits and grants, he would go to university to obtain a degree in, ironically, psychology. His venture into the University of Bradford would eventually award him with a first class honours the highest grade possible in a master's degree. And without much surprise, his main project while at university was around the history of homicide, a project that would further cement his fascination with, and knowledge of, violent death. His purchase history on Amazon spoke to this fascination, with orders that would fill his bookshelves with literature on the likes of Jack the Ripper, The Moore's Murders, and his newfound personal idol and favourite, Peter Sutcliffe, also known as the Yorkshire Ripper. I won't go into much detail on the Yorkshire Ripper, as that is not the focus of this video. However, here is a quick breakdown. He was a man who committed a total of 13 murders from 1975 through to 1980 in the surrounding Yorkshire area. His crimes spanned as far east as Manchester and as far north as Bradford, and the closeness to his own home made the serial killer all the more real to Stephen. At the age of 27, Stephen moved into a small one-bedroom flat in Holmesfield Court just on the edge of Bradford's Red Light District, one of the places that the Yorkshire Ripper himself tended to visit. But perhaps this was just a coincidence, as the University of Bradford was less than a mile away after all. During his time here, Stephen would go through two relationships, both of which were abusive and dysfunctional. One girlfriend reporting that on her last visit, she found every surface of his flat covered in plastic. Understandably, she sensed that something was extremely wrong, so she made her excuses to leave, quickly left the flat, and called off the relationship. And things were even worse for a second girlfriend, as apparently he had been abusive to both her and her dogs. He forced her to cut her friends and her family out of her own life, wouldn't let her answer the door without his permission, and even spiked her drinks with various drugs. After fleeing the relationship, Stephen's second girlfriend was stalked and harassed by him for years. He would spray paint profane words all over her house, stare at her through windows from across the street, and leave threatening voice messages on her phone. I'm not gonna go away, so I guess you'd better. <laughs> Needless to say, she was terrified of the man. And one after another, the women in Stephen's life were apparently disappointing him. Even before his relationships, it was his mother, who had given him a rough upbringing by, in his words, abandoning him as she went to prison. And this moment is suspected to have sparked his not-so-latent hatred of women. Stephen sought solace on the internet, creating an online nickname called Ven Paria, Paria being a word to describe a social outcast. He posted regularly on MySpace, where he described himself as a misanthrope that brought hate into heaven and frequented punk, music, and local message boards, one titled Homicide Massacre. At this point in his life, Stephen had been fantasizing about serial killers for 25 years. 25 years of letting his dark thoughts manifest. 25 years of asking himself when, how, and who. How long would it take for him to give in to his evil fantasies? And if he did it, how long would it take the world to recognize his name? We're moving onward to the year 2009, and the date is the 22nd of June, the middle of England summer. Susan Rushworth, a 43-year-old woman from the Bradford area, left her home to pick up a prescription for methadone, a drug used to aid people in breaking free from opioid addiction. 
She obviously struggled with addiction, but don't let that define her. She had a pleasant upbringing in the countryside, and at the age of 21, she married, settling down with two children. Her life was happy and content for a while, but at the age of 30, her marriage fell apart. Eventually, she divorced before finding a new boyfriend and then having a third child. However, this new man in her life was unfortunately a heroin addict, who subsequently introduced his dangerous habit to Susan. Things began to spiral, and her newfound habit became more expensive. Susan soon found herself selling her body to support her addiction. She would regularly wait outside Bradford's red light district for someone to pick her up, her main call spot being beside the local bus stop. But after she failed to return home that evening, Susan's mother began to worry. She always kept in contact, taking her phone with her wherever she went. The police were called, and a missing person search was launched. But her hours missing turned into days, and eventually, into months. Susan had well and truly disappeared. Fast forward 10 months to the date of April the 26th, 2010. 31-year-old Shelley Armitage, much like Susan, was another woman who was working the streets of Bradford. Shelley had a good upbringing. She was born into a loving family and was a well-loved daughter and sister, dreaming of a glamorous modelling career in her teenage years. Sadly, these dreams were never materialised, and at the age of 16, Shelley unfortunately fell into drug use, which came as a surprise to her family. She did love to party, and got into the world of alcohol and eventually drugs. To fund her growing addiction, she turned to the streets of Bradford, but she would do this discreetly, shielding her family from her sex work, making excuses and hiding her lifestyle. On the day of the 26th of April, Shelley bumped into her parents in town. They had a short conversation and then parted ways. Little did her parents know that this would be the last time they would ever see their daughter again, because much like Susan, she disappeared that very night. At 10.10pm, surveillance footage captured Shelley walking up and down Sunbridge Road, likely looking for a client. But after this footage, Shelley would vanish. On the 21st of May 2010, just 26 days after Shelley's disappearance, and 335 days since Susan had vanished, a third woman, Suzanne Blamires, also went missing. Suzanne was a 36-year-old woman who was also a sex worker residing in Bradford. She worked in the same area as Susan and Shelley. Suzanne was born into a loving family, described by her mother as bubbly and full of confidence, with plenty of friends all around her. As a young adult, she was training to become a nurse, but she loved to go to local raves, and as a result, was introduced to Bradford's rife drug scene. Starting as recreational, that habit would soon become a full-blown expensive addiction by her early 20s. And despite her family's best efforts, giving her support and trying their best to keep her home, the addiction spiralled. And just a few years on, her life was unrecognisable from what it had once been. By 25, the red light district had become a frequent place for her to earn an income. She'd use that money to buy drugs, use those drugs, sleep off the come down, and the following day, repeat it all over again. That lifestyle would carry on until the early morning of the 21st of May, 2010. Suzanne had stayed at her mother's place two nights before, and she was then dropped off by her own home the following morning. But the following day, the 22nd of May, Suzanne's boyfriend started to become worried after she had failed to return home the following night. She had seemed happy the day before, and there was no reason for a silence. But much like the other two, her phone was now switched off, and she was nowhere to be found. And just like that, number three, Suzanne was gone. Across the space of just 12 months, three women had disappeared from the red light district in Bradford, and none of them had been heard from ever since. The situation was only just beginning to heat up for local authorities. Although they'd been notified of two disappearances before, the reports were far enough apart to not seem connected. 
But a third disappearance only a month later was enough of a concerning realisation to start raising eyebrows. And they wouldn't have to wait long, as soon enough, one lead would blow all three cases wide open, leaving the city of Bradford in absolute horror. Just three days after Suzanne's disappearance, a striking discovery emerged in the town of Shipley, located just north of Bradford. It was the early morning, and a lone dog walker was calmly taking a walk along the river air, when he spotted something floating in the river. It was a black rucksack that someone must have dropped in the river by accident. He decided to check the bag out, and it seemed to be full. Upon lifting it out the water, the dog walker found that it was very heavy, maybe around 20 kilograms. And inside the bag, our case's dog walker found something straight out of a nightmare. It was the decapitated head of a person, with a crossbow bolt and a knife still lodged within the skull. And at this stage, the head was beyond any form of normal recognition. The police were alerted immediately, and this finding was very concerning to them. Hindsight can be a blessing, but even at the best of times, it too can be a curse. By now, they were looking into the disappearance of Susan, Shelley, and Suzanne. And with the effects of the Yorkshire Ripper still felt to this day, the sudden realisation was just far too late. They seemed to have a new serial killer on the block. The river and the surrounding area were closed off immediately to the public, as forensics began to search for further evidence. But before they could even finish their work, the next piece of concerning information came in. Two days prior to the finding of the crossbow bolted head, on the morning of the 22nd of May, a humble caretaker of a small complex of flats in Bradford was completing some routine checks on the CCTV of the building that he looked after. And this block of flats was none other than Holmesfield Court, the residence of Stephen Griffiths. Expecting to stumble across some vandalism at worst, the caretaker began to replay the surveillance cameras located around the block. But what he ended up finding was something far more sinister. At 2.30am, a surveillance camera located just outside Stephen's apartment complex captured a woman, Suzanne Blamires, walking with Stephen. They seemed to be heading back to his apartment. Another camera further along shows Stephen and Suzanne getting into the elevators of the building. Everything seemed fine, their behaviour seemed amicable enough. She then follows Stephen into the privacy of his own home. But just three minutes later, the situation becomes much more serious. Only moments after entering the flat, Suzanne is seen bursting from out of the door, running desperately from Stephen, who is pursuing closely, wearing fingerless gloves and brandishing a crossbow. Standing just off the camera, we assume he takes aim at the fleeing woman and fires a bolt, barely missing Suzanne. Continuing his pursuit, he catches up to the terrified woman, grabs her, and wrestles her to the ground. Once again, just out of shot of the camera, he takes aim, this time at point-blank range, before tragically delivering a bolt to her head. Stephen then drags the body into his flat, and, knowing full well that the camera captured the attack, he stepped back into view. He waved his crossbow in front of it and brandished a middle finger, knowing it was simply a matter of time before his crime was discovered. Stephen's final reaction, the finger given to the surveillance camera, shows all too well how little remorse he had to the victim. The gesture wasn't really about her at all. In fact, it was about him. He was angry that he had made such a stupid mistake, a mistake that will eventually lead to his capture. Just one hour after killing Suzanne, Stephen returned to the streets of Bradford's red light district, toasting with a drink to the camera on his way out. He was going out to attempt to lure another woman to his flat. He hoped to gain a fourth victim, knowing time was now of the essence. But his new attempts failed to bear fruit. After leading another woman to the front door of his complex, they stopped to have a short chat. Luckily, the woman must have felt something wasn't right. Perhaps her instincts told her that something was severely wrong with this man. And therefore, she declined his invitation to go inside, safely walking away into the night. Stephen would again return to the streets, only to retreat to his flat less than an hour later, alone. Following the finding of the footage, police did not hesitate in regards to Stephen. 
In fact, the very next day, on Monday the 24th of May 2010, 22 police officers stormed Stephen's property, bringing an end to a series of murders. Upon arrest, he apparently screamed out, I am Osama bin Laden, never really giving any reason for this bizarre comment afterward. And after being taken down to the local police station, Stephen finally realised that his goose was well and truly cooked. Police, they had seen the CCTV footage. There was no way out of this. Stephen confessed to the murders of Susan, Shelley, and Suzanne with relative ease, almost as if his killings gave him bragging rights. Perhaps, in his twisted mind, they did. Although he actually claimed to have killed more than these three women, no evidence of any further murders were ever found. The police launched a full-scale forensics investigation into Stephen's residence, finding blood of all three women throughout his flat. The main points of interest being the bathtub and the stove. While in custody, he would further confess to eating parts of his victims, the first two of which were cooked on the stove, and that parts of the last victim were eaten raw. And soon after, a phone would be discovered containing multiple images and homemade videos of the tortures that he'd put the women through, before killing them and dismembering their bodies. He would even commentate as if he filmed these videos, giving himself the self-chosen title of the bloodbath artist. The phone that contained these photos and videos wasn't actually found in Stephen's flat. Instead, it was found on a local train where Stephen had left it, possibly hoping that it would eventually be found by police, or that the contents would make their way onto the internet, igniting the attention and horrified discussions that he craved so much. Throughout interrogation, Stephen would tell the police more and more small details of how he hurt these women, and he repeatedly described his bathtub as the slaughterhouse. He would vaguely describe where he put the bodies, saying the peculiar phrase, where a robot would put them, trying to sound not human at all. And what sort of location have you put them in? If you can't tell us where, what sort of location have you put them? I don't know. Where a robot, where a computer would put them. Yeah, you know, a rational, emotionless aberration would put it. Why did you feel the need to to kill her? I don't know. I don't know if I was... So, just... Sometimes you kill someone to kill yourself, or kill parties. I don't know, I don't know. There's like deep issues inside me. So why did you feel the need to kill any of the girls? Fun? I don't know. I don't know. Just... Well, I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. In the following weeks, both surveillance footage and witnesses would confirm that Stephen would ferry his victims, bit by bit, in duffel bags and backpacks. He would transport them via public transport to the River Eyre, where he would then dispose of their various body parts. This was also proven to be the case for Shelley Armitage, as eventually, parts of her body were also recovered. However, no remains of Susan Rushworth have ever been found. He admits that he killed her but refuses to tell police what he did with the body, and guards that information closely to this very day. In late May of the same year, Stephen attended a hearing at the Magistrates' Court, where, when asked for his name by the judge, he simply replied with, The Crossbow Cannibal. And on the 16th of November 2010, Stephen's trial began. The trial was attended by many of the victim's family members. It ran for five weeks, though the outcome was pretty obvious from the beginning. And on the 21st of December 2010, Stephen Griffiths was convicted of all three murders after pleading guilty. The judge handed down three life sentences for the grotesque murders of three young women three young women who were left vulnerable during their struggles in life. Susan Rushworth, Shelley Armitage, and Suzanne Blamires. Since his conviction, Stephen has continued to exact control on anything he has the ability to. He has tried to take his own life four times. However, all four attempts have been stopped by staff. He's also attempted to go on hunger strike several times now, all of which is likely just a sad attempt at attention seeking simply to keep his name relevant and to try and feed his narcissistic beliefs. 
Stephen will undoubtedly spend the rest of his life behind bars, serving his sentence in Wakefield Prison. Perhaps Stephen Griffiths had hoped to create some sort of stillness to his name, maybe some sort of terrifying illusion. And while the surveillance footage of him certainly is creepy, he failed to create the atmosphere that his idol once did in the exact same area. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this video interesting, or if you learned something new today, then please remember to like the video and subscribe. What a sick and twisted man. What are your thoughts about Stephen Griffiths? Please let me know in the comments below. And just a quick message to share, but I'm about to move studios, meaning that my videos may be a little thin on the ground for the next two or three weeks. After that, I plan to be back to normal to my Monday schedule. Thank you again for watching today, folks, and you know it by now, I'll be right here, behind this camera, waiting for you in the next one. Until that moment arrives, though, look after each other. Goodbye.